This program is brought to you by Stanford University. Please visit us at stanford.edu. This presentation is delivered by the Stanford Center for Professional Development, providing graduate level education to working professionals online, on campus, and on site. For more information, please visit study.stanford.edu. Today we have Byron Reeves, uh, who many of you know. Byron is a professor here in the Communication Department uh, and also director of a research institute consortium uh, called HSTAR, which encompasses what has been uh, CSLI and uh, Center for Innovation and Learning and the Media X Project program, uh, Phyllis program, which he directs. Um, a lot of you may know him for the book that he and Cliff Nass wrote a few years ago called The Media Equation, uh, which puts together in a very clean, uh, sort of clear way, a uh, whole line of work that they had done over the years about how people respond to computers. And his more recent work, which he'll be talking about today, he's gotten interested in games. And the fact that what people do when they're sitting in front of a computer game is, of course, still very much human nature. It's still what people do. So studying how they respond to those is an excellent way to get some insights into human behavior and human interaction with technology. So he will be talking about that with us today. Go. Thank you. All yours. Okay, good. Um, when Cliff and I came here, I think about 10 years ago when we were writing the media equation, we, and, and uh, it, it occurs to me when Terry was talking about the class that uh, that videotape might actually be around. That would really be fun to look at uh, for me, not for necessarily for anybody in the audience. But okay, okay. Uh, and here's the reason. So when we were when we were here talking about the different uh, studies that we had done as part of the media equation, uh, we were really looking at the subtle characteristics of basic forms of interactivity, some pictures, some voices, but the 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 the, the primitive aspects of of human computer interaction that caused people to interact with machines and pictures as if they were real people and places. And we really had a list of fairly subtle uh, characteristics of interactivity. And uh, I, I mention that because this almost 10 years later, I think I might have been here once in the interim, but almost 10 years later is the exact opposite with respect to the degree of subtlety of the features of interactivity uh, that these games have that might cause people to respond in these experiences as if all those little avatars and the information and the voices and were real people in a situation, in a, in a live human-to-human uh, -human interaction. So this is one of the most complex pieces of, of interface that I'm aware of, and it's certainly one of a, a, an interface where the volume knob on socialness is turned up to where it's almost screaming. In fact, I haven't turned up the audio here. You wouldn't be able to actually hear me. But um, this is uh, uh, a uh, clip from uh, actual play uh, from colleagues of mine who are actually in the back room here who can say much more about the particulars of this than I ever could. But this is uh, several people on a collaborative action, in a collaborative action arrayed in World of Warcraft. And I need to know how many World of Warcraft people there are here. If you, do you, if you have an avatar in World of Warcraft, this is one of the, so the humanities and social sciences are far ahead, if, if this is a technical engineering CS audience, are far ahead of you on this. And, and we know from uh, people who study, uh, uh, people who study how, uh, how people get interested in CS majors and, and technical subjects that this is likely to be an entree right now, this kind of interaction and the technology behind it, an entree for interests uh, uh, among adolescents to actually uh, get into uh, uh, these, these technical areas. Uh, so I need to say a little bit more about, rather than less, I was not sure exactly how much to say about this interface, because this is the world th that, that I have been trying to be steeped in to, to use as a laboratory to continue studying what is 
What is it that is social and natural and uh, powerful, engaging about this interaction? And I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the basic research about, that we've done as people are experiencing uh, these interactions. And that's, uh, I'm basically a psychologist with interest or psychological interests, and in I'm in the Department of Communication, but interests in how people respond individually to this. But as also as part of this talk, I really want to mention uh, and, and really go quite a distant, distance beyond that to talk about the implications of a lot of these interactions for serious context. Not, I mean, the, the entertainment implication is, uh, is fairly obvious that, uh, that, that when you, that, these, that they're fun, they're, they're, they're a ton of fun and that uh, um, people are spending money on these and I'll mention that a little bit. But these are very, th th there's a lot to be stolen from this interface, from the technology, from the experience, the collection of experiences that people have as they uh, develop experience uh, with these kind of games that we can apply to serious context. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that as well. So um, this is, uh, there, there are so you all are aware that this is a three-dimensional virtual space and that these little avatars are uh, individual people who are in there with their computer who are navigating a 3D world, but are also collaborating substantially uh, in lots of other ways. We, uh, so me and Niven we back don't help the rest of them. And I'm going to turn it down, yeah, but there's, there's, uh, uh, there's a lot of voice interaction here. Uh, there's communication that's going on, uh, different levels of public and privateness uh, with, with, for the entire collaborative group. These are uh, collaborative actions that may have uh, you know, 40 people, 100 people that had to plan to spend seven or eight hours to meet in the same place in a virtual world to take on a particular challenge defined by the game. Uh, they may have a, probably have a website set up uh, to plan for the event, to share loot that comes from the event, and not only to share it with a lot of talk, but with algorithms that divide up uh, 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 common, uh, the, the common loot from the group. And as you can see here, this is really a complex interface that's very familiar to seven and a half million people who are, um, uh, have subscriptions in World of Warcraft. That's just, that, that's just that one title. And a lot of this that, uh, that I'm talking about, there are certainly other titles. There aren't a hundred other titles, but there are tens of other titles. There's Second Life. There are other virtual worlds that don't have the gaming component here. A lot of the features that we've been interested in are similar across all those features. But it, the, just the complexity of this is important to appreciate. So my, up in the upper left there, my status in this game is displayed visually, uh, is updated moment by moment. The status of my closest uh, rating partners are the bars right under that in the, in the upper left here. I have all kinds of spells and tools and actions that I can take on this environment arrayed down here. I have uh, the logistics and communication channels that I can turn on. I can, you know, we can just do my three people, uh, the entire group of 40, only the leadership group, whatever I, whatever I need to do, all reconfigured, reconfigurable moment by moment. Uh, I can figure out uh, how everybody else in the raid is doing. I have a particular role in the raid, by the way. Uh, I've, I've taken that on as I've created this avatar. I'm a uh, uh, a warrior, a mage, a priest, I heal, I kill, whatever my particular role is, and I cannot succeed in my group and get a share of the loot unless we all succeed. So this is very much a, a psychological, sociological mash here where we've got my motivations and little twitches and, and interest in the game that has to be coordinated with all of our interests in the game or I don't advance to level 60 uh, which is the highest level as of this week, but next week there'll be more levels. Um, and uh, I'm spending, by the way, I'm just trying to fill in uh, the back, I'm spending, um, Nick Yee, a graduate student in communication that's been working on these games, estimates about 450 hours to get to level 60 on average. So this is not a, a trivial thing. I might be uh, just fine with level 17 and have a lot of fun uh, 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 with, with a couple of characters at lower levels, but generally I'm trying to, uh, to go up in rank. Uh, there's a look down map because this is 
many tens of square miles that I can actually navigate through in, in this virtual world and more added on all the time. So I've got maps and uh, I've got uh, uh, buffs that I can put on uh, uh, playing partners to protect them from, uh, from evil. Uh, just a lot of stuff happening in this interface. And it's all updating moment by moment. It's all configurable by players. My screen is going to look a little bit different than Terry's screen because I've got different uh, uh, windows that I'd like to have open. I, I may place the camera in a different place than Terry places his camera. He might zoom out a little bit or he might want near term or near action uh, I'll look at this. So it's, a, an, it's an incredibly complex interface. And it's, all the titles have different narratives. There's a, that's actually a very important part of uh, uh, these different games. There are stories that organize battles between these guys over here and these guys over here. And they've been warring, of course, for the last 3,000 years. And, uh, and just a lot of uh, narrative richness uh, and, and media richness in here. And we'll look at a couple other, other pictures as we go here. But I just wanted to start out by uh, trying to give you a quick flavor of the complexity of these interfaces and the possibilities in these interfaces before I start uh, uh, showing you a little bit more about, about the research that we've done. I'm going to mention a couple other um, characteristics of these games uh, before getting into the research. Uh, some of this I, I probably managed to get into the introduction here. Uh, a lot of people are making a lot of money in games in general. Uh, what I'm talking about here, the research work that I'm interested in, the applications I'm interested in, are really the more complex multiplayer games. Uh, not as much uh, relevance of some of these features to single player Twitch games, uh, racing, uh, you know, trying to move something uh, from one place to another or turn a card or whatever. But uh, there's a lot of money being spent. Uh, 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 several of the new titles have subscription uh, uh, rates that are very interesting with respect to the business of games. I mentioned seven and a half million for World of Warcraft. Uh, Second Life, which totally amazes me, uh, uh, I was uh, with those folks uh, about three months ago and they were hoping for a million people by the end of the year. Uh, I just went on the website this morning and they now have 2.5 million people that have uh, characters in Second Life. Not all of them are there at the same time and several of the avatars I'm sure have been stored or not used for the last three months. But the amount of information that they report uh, is, is really, uh, the growth rate is really uh, starting to, to, to uh, kick into the curve part of that. A uh, million dollars in the last tra uh, 24 hours has been traded in Second Life, or, or Linden dollars, the virtual currency. The equivalent of that amount of real dollars was traded in the last day. So there are serious, there's serious economic activity in these games. Uh, the demographics for the games are very much changing. So since there are not that many players here, I'm sure the stereotype of the kind of action that I showed you would be the 14 or 15 year old adolescent boy, and certainly there are some of those playing the game, but the average, the median age is 29 or 30 right now. There are many people, play, most of the people that are playing have full-time jobs, uh, and, and, or are students, uh, and that's probably why not very many people raise their hand because there are professors in the room and didn't want to admit that. Uh, <laughs> Uh, Nick Yi, who, who I depend on for a lot of this background information, erased his copies of his MMO games, these multiplayer, massive multiplayer online games, erased them when he became a PhD student. Uh, after about a month, he just knew that he wasn't going to be able to advance in Star Wars Galaxies and get a PhD. <laughs> They're increasingly gender balanced. Uh, World of Warcraft that I showed you is not gender balanced. It certainly favors uh, uh, boys and males, uh, but uh, 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 Second Life is equal, uh, males and females in that virtual environment. Most people work, and there's just a ton of general interest in this interface as perhaps the third generation of user interface, and this is all the metaverse interest, and I'll mention some of the uh, the interest that companies have, uh, that uh, educational uh, programs have, and in, in being inside of these games and uh, and and creating offerings that that fall within within the uh, environments themselves. There's an economics to these games, and this is a, a getting to be a, a a decent separate literature, not necessarily one that I cover, but you can go. Uh, and and I know there's wireless in the room, and you can do it right now. I'm not going to do it live, but uh, um, you. Go to eBay and type in 
World, World of Warcraft Gold or Star Wars Galaxies uh, Yoda, uh, Wookiee or whatever, and currency, artifacts, uh, swords, uh, whatever, are for sale, for real dollars. And that has, uh, and you probably haven't been able to escape the, uh, the mentions of that fact in the popular press about people farming the games to create characters. Uh, and, and if you, excuse me, if you make 10 cents or 50 cents an hour out of those 450 hours to create a level 60 character, you might be able to sell it for 200, 500, 1,000 uh, dollars. And if we could find a place where people actually get that low uh, uh, an hourly rate, wage, um, uh, you can actually make some money doing this, and that's uh, gotten to be a, a pretty well-known story about the games as well. Uh, so there is an economic context. It's, I didn't mention this one result here, which I love. This is from my uh, colleague at Indiana University, Ted Castronova, who is the uh, uh, expert economist that study these games. Uh, he went in a couple of years ago. This title, the Star Wars Galaxies title, is not as popular as it used to be, but when they had about a half million players, he, he was... Uh, very active in that game, and he went into the game and he looked at, he cataloged all the artifacts that were possible to acquire in that game and looked to see what they were selling for on the open market at that time. Not unlike going to see, you know, the, the stock page of the paper and going to see what the HP, uh, share of HP stock is selling for. Now, if everybody sold their HP stock on the same day, it would obviously not be worth very much at all. But that's how you calculate the gross domestic product of, uh, uh, of, of uh, economies. So he went in and said, well, if everybody sold all their stuff in Star Wars Galaxies, how much money would they have? $2,700 was the answer, which made Star Wars Galaxy the 72nd largest economy in the world at that time, right in between Bulgaria and Morocco who had per capita incomes that were just a little bit above and a little bit below. So this is a serious uh, activity for that reason as well. And this is all in preface to some of the psychological studies that I, that I want to uh, show you or talk to you about. So there, here's another piece of context that I think is very important. And this is that there is a generation of folks. I'm not sure you know, that this is the, 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 the substitute title for Generation Y or Generation Next, but it's at least important that when you play in these games, especially the complex multiplayer games, there is, you, develop, uh, uh, you develop interests and methods and process inclinations that are different and that are really interesting. For one thing, competition is kind of what it's all about. It's, and, and no one's really, uh, I mean, certainly people are into the games, but it's, it's a little more familiar and it's a lot more fun. And, maybe a little less cutthroat than we might imagine if we hadn't, hadn't played. But failure is just part of this. We've got to get together and try stuff, and, well, that didn't work. Uh, let's try something else. So uh, trial and error is a learning strategy. Very important. Uh, it's, there, are no ma there are manuals, and there are plenty of websites to actually to go to and find out the best way to do X or Y, but there's a whole lot of trial and error. Uh, risk is familiar. Uh, feedback, as you saw in that interface, there is feedback moment by moment that is, that is stunning in its, in its uh, uh, interest value and relevance to, uh, to how engaged I am in that process. Um, I always think I can have an answer, figure it out if I'm given enough time. Uh, they're certainly very decentralized with respect to command and control and bosses. They're, uh, they're, they're, it's a very horizontal uh, operation, although there are guild leaders. Uh, group action, is, as the collaboration with these tools is very familiar, and the collaboration is, is rather sophisticated. Uh, there's a, 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 a process that I learned about called DKP. Is there anybody here that knows what DKP is other than uh, my uh, friends Helen and David in the corner? Is anybody? I'm just interested. That's no one. Okay, it stands for Dragon Kill Points, and it's an artifact uh, gaming technology. This is all uh, uh, information, of course, that's been fed to me by my gamer colleagues, not necessarily that I've obtained from personal experience. But this is, this is the process by which we all get together and before we go on the raid, decide who's going to get what if we win. Who's going to get the ability to bid on the one sword that drops from the monster 
during the raid. We can't divide it up into 40 pieces. So we're going to have an algorithm that's based uh, uh, right now very much on uh, allocation of points based on uh, participation in the raids. If this is a seven hour deal and we're doing it every other night, uh, you better, uh, you're going to get uh, more opportunity to do the bidding or do the sharing to the extent you've participated here. But group, th the point is that group action is complex and it's familiar. And there are arguments and those are familiar as well. And of course, uh, uh, these uh, groups that collaborate are from all over the place. Uh, they could easily be a dorm floor here at Stanford that decides to all play at the same time, but more likely there are people uh, from across the country, across age groups, across genders, uh, uh, cultures, continents uh, that are part of the same group and there are lots of fun stories about that. So a gamer generation I think is a, a very interesting thought to, to think about how they might respond. If you take all those, all those uh, characteristics of that generation, how do they respond when they get to a business that offers them software that's crummier than what they had at home. Ten years ago, it used to be the other way around. We used to have to go to work to get the cool stuff. Now it's crummier, it's slower, it's not as interesting, it doesn't have uh, the visual appeal, it doesn't have the affordances that, that we're used to. Uh, what's going to happen there is, is really interesting. So another thing that we've been trying to do is figure out what, what are the elements, and this is almost a, th this is prior to any application that we might build or really any studies that, uh, that we might do. We, all, we had our eye on looking at a lot of these games and trying to figure out what was the recipe for building the good big ones. And it, it, it certainly is the case that uh, even a good cook, but especially a bad cook, could really screw up a recipe. So it's not a recipe in the sense of do these things and they will come. That's not the case at all. This is very much a hit-driven business and, and the art matters and narrative matters and story writing and all these things matter. But these, these are some places or some elements and features of the games to look at to get an idea of why they might be engaging. And I'm going to spend a, uh, a, a, some time with only a couple of these today, but I wanted to give you the whole list here. One is this notion of self-representation. And, and let me introduce that now because the studies that I'll mention are in that area. This is, um, you, you have an avatar that is not you, but kind of like you, maybe a mini-me of some sort, that is now in this screen and that you control you choose, you dress, uh, you repair uh, inventory, etc. And that is a very interesting characteristic of, the, of, of how you're going to interact with other people. And there are a lot of qualities of that avatar that might be very interesting. That, that character that appears on the screen, mine is certainly controlled by me, but I might interact with some that are controlled by a computer, some that are controlled by other players, etc. But the notion that I have represented myself not by words, not by a photograph, although that's along the same continuum with respect to interest. I mean, uh, the, kind of the MySpace representation is very much an avatar-like representation as far as uh, I'm concerned with respect to the psychology of this. But now it's full motion and it's a lot that the, the social bandwidth is, is really extended there. So that's one thing that's really interesting and engaging about these games. And those avatars have reputations and they have ranks and levels and the reputations are public and transparent and persistent and uh, a lot of things that are different than, than, than maybe than my representation uh, as a human. Um, there's a lot of feed, interesting feedback in these games that is uh, an important element, especially feedback in short time domains, which is a, a whole area of research. I'm not going to talk about this today, but um, uh, of, of new studies that we're thinking about. What is it like to be involved in an extended period in an interaction where moment by moment you are, you are getting information as to whether you're on track or not, or whether it's fun or not, or whether other people like what you're doing or not. So forget the quarterly annual review. This is really, this is the equivalent of, of the Pac-Man biting the little, little dots. It's, it's, you, there are sounds and, and words and reinforcement in very small time domains. Uh, uh, these are all done within a narrative, sometimes rich narratives that have places, and that's important. The other one that I'm going to mention a little bit with respect to the application here is the notion of a marketplace. All of these games have sophisticated economies that are virtual economies. Yes, you can trade some of them for dollars, but even beyond that, they're very interesting in that they create exchange mechanisms that operate very much like real money, but they're not. So you can do a lot of the things. You can keep track of things. You can know who's got more, who's got less. I can use 
uh, a currency to, uh, to, uh, to entice you to participate or to reward or whatever. So those are very important. And, and a, a few of the, the teams being another important part here. Some of these others are self-explanatory, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kind of uh, move on to talk about a couple different research areas and then mention some applications. Okay, so the first one is this notion of self-representation. This has been uh, of great interest over the last two or three years. And it's really something, I mean, we could imagine doing some of these studies, uh, or could have imagined, we actually didn't, doing some of these studies uh, with older technology, but they've really come on in interest now that we have the ability to create a very rich uh, representation of ourselves and throw it into this 3D world. Okay, so this is, a, uh, I'm going to start with a very primitive response to uh, something that uh, in the HCI literature is kind of known as the avatars versus agents uh, paradigm here. And, and, and that is only the definition of those terms. Uh, an agent is one of these little characters uh, uh, that is, it could be just a bunch of code, but in our case, one of these characters that's controlled by a computer. So it's doing things automatically. You walk up to it, it comes walk, walks closer to you by algorithm versus an avatar that is a representation of me that I am actually controlling. So I've got my fingers on the, on the arrow keys and I'm making it go left and right and I'm pressing the macro to make it smile or jump up and down or, or reach out or whatever. Um, but there are different versions of that. So let me mention a, a first study here that actually looks at a very primitive game uh, that doesn't have uh, 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 our current notion of avatar at all. And here's the game. Uh, in fact, this game is this yellow thing right here with these two green dots. Um, the game is you are the dot in the center, more or less in the center, and you will be using that joystick to chase the other dot that's kind of in the upper right-hand corner. And it's that other dot in the upper right-hand corner is going to move around in that square, and you're going to use your joystick to follow it, follow it around. Now, while you're playing this game, you're in uh, an fMRI scanner which is to say your, the, the engagement of different places of your brain is being assessed based on magnetic responses of all the uh, chemistry, neuro, neurochemistry. Uh, so you're on this little tube here. I don't know if anybody's had an fMRI here, but you're looking at a, you're lying down and you've got your joystick down here and you, you are looking at a, a mirror that uh, is the uh, uh, representation of the game. And you're going to do, play this game, we're not, it's not the, this half of the room versus this half of the room, but you're, the same person is going to play the game in two different ways. So the first way you play the game is the other dot that you're following is a dot that's being controlled by Frank and Frank Waves, who's right in the other room. So Frank is going to move his dot around and you follow him. And we're going to see how well you do. We're going to kind of track that. And we're going to do trials several different trials of that, all, a lot of the methods here being related to just the fMRI technology. And then we're going to play it another way. You, same game, same joystick, same dots, only that other dot in this case is controlled by a computer. So there's a computer that's deciding where the dot should go and you, you chase it, you chase that dot. Now in fact, in the experiment, the dot is being controlled by a computer in both cases. Even though Frank waved, he's not really back there uh, controlling the computer. The interesting, you know, the interesting result is that these are dramatically different events psychologically and with respect to neural activation. When you are following the dot that is controlled by another, computer, by a, another human being, you are getting activation in brain areas that, that are activated in uh, situations of human empathy, of self-other connectedness, just all kinds of sh social stuff. So there's a very social response. When you are following the dot and you think it is controlled by a computer, the activation is more related to psychophysics. Uh, upper left, get the hand to move, you know, all the different places in the brain that are associated with, with that kind of motion. So that's something that's really pretty different. Uh, and, it, and it now starts to suggest what, would, what kinds of results would you get uh, if you actually took the same, uh, or just substituted this game for something much more media rich like the game I showed you. Because there are possibilities in that game that those avatars could be controlled by a computer. Most of them are other players, of course, but you get the, the same kind of um, um, 
same kind of possibility. So a couple studies, there's one study that we have going is to take the World of Warcraft and now we're going to play World of Warcraft in the magnet. But as a preface to that, we've actually, so I, I do a lot of um, recording of individuals uh, that doesn't have anything or much to do with what people say. So I don't say, uh, play with these two different kinds of characters and then um, and, and uh, tell me which one was more interesting or around, which one was more engaging or involving. Because it's very difficult to know and you may not have a good response to that. So we do a lot of uh, psychophysiological assessment, which is pretty easy now. It's much less intrusive or bothersome than the, than the magnet uh, and its electrodes. Maybe some of you have been subjects in these studies. It's electrodes on your hand or finger or maybe on your face uh, that uh, uh, assess electrical activity of some sort, uh, either skin conductance responses, which indicate autonomic arousal, this primitive response of the body to, to be involved in, in a stimulus. And then we also look at heart rate acceleration and deceleration, which, you know, our hearts are always going a little bit faster, a little bit slower in relation to things that are happening in our environment. And we can um, kind of put a tachometer on that and, and tell some interesting things. That's a whole ton of psychology and probably for this context uh, just have to uh, take my word that that's an interesting criterion. If you can make those two measures vary, then something's interesting with respect to the stimulus. So what we did, what we did was the, the, the green dot experiment, only now with World of Warcraft char characters. So um, you're going to go into World of Warcraft. Uh, these are players generally not familiar with World of Warcraft, so they were very willing to be told that the other player you're cooperating or collaborating or fighting is either controlled by a computer or controlled by another individual. So the same, same kind of setup. So all these avatars, uh, either an agent or, uh, or all these characters, either an agent or an avatar. And here are the responses. You can see over the course of a, about a six minute session doing these several different things. This is a rather large physical difference in response. Uh, just, uh, let's just highlight the, the heart rate response. Your heart is beating, and this is the same subject. So Terry's heart, if he's a normal subject, is beating almost 10 beats per minute faster when he's interacting with a piece of media, just a bunch of fluorescent light on a screen, that he thinks is controlled by another human being versus uh, the exact same interactions, no difference, uh, and just this mental frame that, that it's being controlled uh, by a computer. So rather large uh, physical differences. Uh, in this agent avatar, this notion of self-representation. So something is interesting about these avatars, that there's a lot of engagement here, uh, physical engagement, primitive engagement, neural engagement in, in, uh, in what's going on. Uh, and I'm going to mention, actually, I'm going to, uh, I, I forgot what time we started, Terry. I'm, I'm going to look at my watch here. We're, so if, if we did 50 minutes, we'd be at 12, right. 12.30, or, or 1.30 30 would be, yeah. okay, okay. Two, so. Okay. Um, you, can get, you can get a similar agent avatar result uh, with, with other media, which, and I've been interested in this for about 10 years. You can take the same video clip, and I can tell you it's an actor who's pretending to cry, or I can tell you it's a real woman who is crying for a real reason. Same picture, and I take 100 of those clips, and I introduce them as real people or actors, and then I measure the physiology of response, and this is, uh, and, I'm, I, and you get the same results. You get much more, much higher, greater heart rate when you think it's a, a, a real uh, actor than when you think it's a, a piece of uh, fiction. So this, this whole issue of being caught between fact and fi fiction uh, is a, a theme that goes far beyond the, the, the avatar agent thing and, and really even to watching the news or really doing anything with media. What is your mental set when you're processing this information? And then, of course, the other, the other uh, important question to ask, uh, actually, I, I think that's the next, next study. Yes, the next important question to ask is, what does that matter? So my autonomic system is aroused. Well, in, in learning science, for example, we know that that system is critical to taking input and uh, learning and remembering information, uh, categorizing it well, um, and memory of different sorts. So I'm going to mention a... Uh, uh, we have this, uh, a lab uh, actually that meets once a week around this, this issue of 
of uh, agents and avatars. And this is a study uh, done by Sandra, Jeremy, and Dan uh, uh, in the context of this lab that, that takes this arousal response, which we started with the agent avatar, and extends it to learning. So you, you're in a lab and you're reading a passage about uh, fever or some medical malady, you're playing a game, and then you put on the virtual reality goggles, and you interact with a person, or, 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 or I don't have a picture of it, this is the subject watching a screen that has a picture of a woman that is introduced as either an agent or an avatar. And then we're looking not only to, at arousal now, but we're looking at the amount of learning that takes place in those two, two situations. And this is some information on that. First of all, the avatar condition is more arousing than the agent condition. And, uh, and I'm going to help, help you process, I'm not, I'm not sure how much I'm going to help, but we're going to process this really quickly. And you learn more when the arousal is higher. So in the avatar condition, where you think it's really another person that's behind that, that representation on the screen, uh, learning is better in terms of memory for information that was actually presented, and really interestingly for uh, uh, for solving problems based on the information that you got. So the extension of learning beyond the actual information that was presented. So that's really a kind of exciting result as well and uh, suggests that this uh, agent avatar distinction is, is important as, a, as, as it might be applied in a learning context, which um, you know, there are tons of uh, pieces of software that are building uh, avatars and agents both uh, uh, in, in the, to, to, to teach people various things. This is just the arousal level over the course of the entire experiment. Um, I'm going to I, I won't I'm going to mention three or four other results just to kind of give you a sense of the the other aspects of the self representation that we think is really important. One is uh, choosing a character. So the question here was, if I go into one of the games and I'm assigned a character, versus I go into one of the games and I get uh, an inventory or menu of characters, and I choose that character. And in this experiment, not even, not even uh, dress it or nurture it or repair it or whatever, but just actually choose it, that investment is a very important for arousal. And I get much greater arousal and an involvement, engagement in characters that I've chosen versus characters that I've had assigned. So that might be an interesting interface um, uh, affordance. Um, where I put the camera in these games is really important. Uh, in the game now, so you can, you can go into the, a virtual world or a game and actually use a series of keys to figure out where you'd like the camera placed. First of all, you can toggle whether the camera is the eye of the character. And I don't know if you can see this well, but uh, this is where I just see the gun. You know, here's the screen and I can just see the gun. I don't see my arms or anything. So the, the camera in this scene is, is my eyes versus put the camera anywhere else in the room. On the ceiling, zoomed way out, uh, uh, general over the right shoulder is uh, uh, a favorite place where uh, game players put their camera, but it's a third person perspective. And a couple interesting results uh, here. First of all, first person perspective here is, is substantially more arousing than third person perspective. So walking around, more, kind of like a VR uh, navigation, is more arousing. When, when people have a choice of where to toggle the camera, very few gamers now are doing first person. So World of Warcraft, I think Nick said, was almost 90% uh, third person, because you get this great sense of control uh, by being able to kind of zoom out. It's not quite as arousing to get zapped or to shoot somebody or go around a corner, but you have a, a, a much greater sense of control and maybe a little bit of a, a greater sense of, uh, 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 I can't remember what I was going to say. So the, a greater sense of control, I can't remember the other one. People, people like it a lot and that third person's perspective. Okay. Why is the heart rate the opposite direction? Oh, on this, this yeah. one right here, this is actually interesting. So this is a, this is a cardiac response curve uh, that, that, so heart rate can tell us uh, about active versus passive responses. So uh, the dip in heart rate here is uh, a response uh, uh, called an orienting response that, that happens. Uh, if somebody burst into the room right now, all of our hearts would slow down. 
would, would dip. Uh, and it's a passive response in, its, in that it's evaluative. Is that important? Should I, should I leave the room? Should I get out of the way? What should I do? Blood flow has actually changed. The active response is a, an acceleration of, heart, of, of the heart rate, and you get uh, a, a greater acceleration. It's, you great, get a greater sense of action uh, as, as indicated by the heart signature in the third person. If that. And actually, we use heart rate. One of the interesting things about active versus passive media is that uh, if, I'm, if I'm just sitting and that's the television set and it's kind of just washing over me, when new things happen, when surprising things happen, I get orienting responses. I get these responses where my heart actually uh, slows down a couple beats. If I have a mouse and I'm, I, I'm in control of the information, I'm clicking on that, I get acceleration to, oh, jeez. <laughs> I get heart rate acceleration to the exact same, oh geez, uh, the exact same stimulus. So it's, it's very much of an active posture. It's, I've done the evaluation. I'm taking action on my environment. Okay. I will never do all of these. I think I've given you a sense of uh, uh, this notion of self-representation. I think I'm going to just uh, switch to kind of the second part here, and I want to talk a little bit about implications for uh, learning and work. And, and some of these are familiar and some of these are uh, a, a little novel. And I think that, the, first of all, the, the games and learning area, which I won't spend too much time on, but just mention, is, is just burgeoning. I mean, there's a conference a week you can go to, to uh, that, that, that attempts to mash up people with game design sensibilities and educators, and we're really going to teach people physics right because we're going to have them engaged and they're going to be part of this uh, multiplayer environment, and they'll have uh, all the affordances that the game players have, and we'll really learn physics this time. And, and I think that can kind of, that, that, that's kind of happening. It's, it's, it's unfortunate in the first instances of this have, have largely been things where the gaming part of it kind of sucks. It's, it's, it's not, in, I mean, it's not World of Warcraft at all. Uh, that's too hard to do. Uh, that's a, a $60 million venture, by the way. Uh, so it's kind of like making a movie just to teach physics. That's probably not going to happen. But you get, you get a, an attempt to create some sort of uh, character presentation, and we've done some work on uh, this in the past, and even rudimentary forms of these characters do, uh, do have an impact. So that's, that's one. But, but they do present learning information in informal contexts where implicit learning is, is very, uh, uh, very interesting. This is... Uh, I just stuck this picture on here. I'm not able to actually get out to it right now, but this is a, a schizophrenia award in a virtual hospital created by a UC Davis doctor. Uh, and if you uh, ever go to Second Life or if you just Google uh, schizophrenia, if you can spell it, and uh, UC Davis, you'll get uh, a little movie of this where I, I, I go as an avatar. I show up in this hospital, and I put on a badge that makes me a schizophrenic. And I walk through this hospital looking at pictures and posters and interacting with people from the perspective of, a, of someone with that illness. And it was done to actually teach doctors what it might feel like to actually uh, have that illness. And it is stunning. I mean, it, you actually have to sign a little hu human subjects form when you enter the hospital. So, uh, so there's a learning, a, a, a learning experience that would not be possible other than by that involvement in that self-representation. Uh, I'm going to mention a couple other things, and this gets to the part where I was telling Terry and a few of the students earlier that uh, we have, uh, you know, there's more stuff going on with these games than we could possibly cram into uh, the, the, uh, the first hour here. But I, I, I thought it might be interesting to, to mention just a couple of the different projects that are really extensions of the basic research. So this is a little bit of an of a end of page, end of paragraph here. One, one project we just did, um, and I, I won't have time to show you some of the video, but it had to do with uh, a corporate, corporate interest in what happens to leaders in these games, uh, not that are necessarily self-identified as leaders, but the, the whole concept of leadership. So we mentioned something about collaboration. Uh, and this was a project that was done for IBM. So they have uh, a thousand people in IBM. Either, uh, I'm not sure how many IBMers there are in the world, probably a couple hundred thousand. But they have a thousand people who have self-identified as game players who have an avatar. So at IBM when they said, who's, who's got an avatar in World of Warcraft? 
Uh, they said it over the internet, not in a room like this, but a thousand people said, here's my email address, I want to be part of that group, I've got an avatar. Uh, and they have a matrix group across the company that's very interested, that's developed into a huge business unit that's now looking at what can we take from these experiences, what can these thousand people build or consult about that, uh, that uh, clients will be interested in. And leadership is one of the areas where they started out, um, and we started out with them, um, uh, and looking at different uh, aspects of the games and, and how people go about leading in these games, and is it similar or different uh, to how we lead in real life? And there are too many words on this slide, but I'll mention just a couple of the interesting uh, things that happen here. First of all, this, this complex guild arrangement, these collaborative actions require that somebody be in charge. And there are different ways that that, ha that that tends to happen in the games. First of all, in the middle here, it happens really quickly. Uh, instead of leadership being defined in these games as something that uh, you're born with and we discover about you as a result of a battery of tests or recommendations of your colleagues, instead, all of us are thrown in to a common place in the game and a clock starts ticking and we've got one minute to decide who's going to lead and what the first three things we're going to do are. So it's, it's a much lighter uh, notion of who's going to be in charge. And it's a kind of a turn in the barrel notion of, of, of how this is going to unfold. So you lead now, you kind of know what this is about, I'll lead tomorrow. Uh, uh, so the, the uh, roles are very temporary. Uh, there's a whole lot of risk taking that's encouraged. Uh, we get to practice this and it's uh, really a lot of things happen. One of the interesting things that came about fr uh, from the study is this conclusion here that there is a lot happening in these games. Well, first of all, IBM, what's a good leader at IBM? It is all what the psychologists say make up good leadership. It's all about you and your training, your natural abilities, um, uh, your sensibilities, what you've, what you've been able to put together in your career. In the games, one of the, the emphasis really seemed to be quite the opposite. It wasn't necessarily the leaders, although it's, you know, it's good to be, have natural inclinations for good leadership, but it's the environment, the infor affordances, the tools, the interface that make it possible for almost anybody to be a good leader. All the metrics, all the collaborative tools, all the ways to find people to work with, and uh, uh, the incentives that are available, uh, the transparency of reputations, and so a lot of different affordances. So I, I mentioned this as a, an example of a, of a corporate interest in an application of game sensibilities. A lot of this come from, not all of it come from the, from, uh, the research on uh, self-representation, but a lot of it comes from that. And the, I would say the second most important thing is this notion of, of incentives uh, uh, and economies and, and methods to keep score and methods to trade uh, and the affordances that are, that are built into these games uh, around the notion of an economy. So that's uh, uh, the notion of leadership. There, there's a, a bunch of other ideas about how to apply the sensibilities of gaming in the real world. So I mentioned a little bit about learning. Uh, there are training and simulation uh, 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 applications like uh, with, uh, with respect to leadership. Let me mention just a couple other wild ideas that uh, uh, actually an off-campus group uh, and I have been thinking about. Um, so here's uh, Nick in um, Star Wars Galaxies. In this game you have to be, you have to take on a profession and you have to build things uh, and you have to trade things and you can only advance in the game uh, by building and trading and uh, Nick decided to be a doctor and when you're a doctor uh, you've got to spend tens and tens and probably a couple hundred hours learning stuff and advancing through a hierarchy of specialties and you have to get raw resources to make pharmaceuticals, to give to uh, wounded warriors uh, who will pay you uh, when they're coming out of battle, etc. And you can imagine all the narrative around this. And one of the things that you have to do is learn how to use uh, um, uh, medical devices in the context of this game. So this is uh, 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 part of an idea to take gaming and embed in gaming serious work. So uh, there's an arbitrary, th this is one of the scanners you use in the hospital in Star Wars Galaxies. And the idea here is to take uh, a feed of actual medical information 
and put it on the scanner. So this is a cancer scan of a cell from a, a, a body. And build into the narrative of that game a mechanism for people to actually make judgments uh, and uh, aggregate those judgments across a whole lot of people. So instead of the arbitrary dumb stuff that Star Wars Galaxy had, feed in something that was, um, that was actually real. And you can imagine kind of the business models around that of, uh, uh, you know, it's not so much you're going to do the surgery uh, based on what uh, you know, 100 gamers tell you to, uh, to do, but you might, uh, you might uh, if you're a reinsurer, uh, and, and you're looking at uh, medical imaging and you want to just kind of ring the bell, hey, you better look at this one because none of the gamers can find it and the real doctor could and he wants uh, you know, $100,000 for the treatment. But this is uh, 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 some math that we actually did around this with a pathologist at Eli Lilly. Um, and here's what we came up with. If you, if you kind of uh, turn the crank on this, 35 players who are gamers in Star Wars Galaxies, who are willing to spend 20 hours to practice to learn how to be 60% accurate in judging whether that cell was cancer or not, can do better than an average pathologist. Yes. Yes. That, there is a, 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 we did this little paper and there's the correlation issue here, but it's, a, it's an interesting wisdom of crowd application here. And, and it's, it's, this is interesting here, but the, the engagement that you might get from this kind of a mechanism might actually get people to like their job better, stay at it a little bit more, and then you can start applying this all over the place. What if we did it to security? Uh, you know, find Osama in the crowd, uh, uh, look for, you know, uh, analyze data, you know, from IP cameras, uh, be a TSA baggage scanner. Uh, you get the same kind of wisdom of crowd benefit, but you also get the, all the great baggage from the game. I'm involved in a narrative. False positives are great. Every baggage scanner can find a bomb an hour or a bomb a day instead of none in their lifetime. They might stick around a couple more months uh, in their job, uh, which would be huge uh, with respect to uh, uh, the economic value of that. So uh, lots of different uh, uh, applications that, that we've, we've looked at there. Um, I'll mention uh, this one really quickly. We, we, uh, this is a game called Puzzle Pirates. It's an MMO. It's a two-dimensional game. You can actually play on a dial-up. But there are avatars, and you have, uh, uh, you have to organize in groups of avatars and join a ship and find a captain who will take you. And uh, when you go to that ship, well, first of all, you are, you have a, you, you don't, it's not as cool a 3D model, but you've got a reputation. It's available for anybody to see. The captain can decide uh, how good you are and when he, when he chooses you. All of this is updated every game, moment by moment, which is another interesting quality here. And then to participate in, with my group on my ship and to make my ship better than your ship, we all puzzle. So we do little Tetris-like puzzles, and there are different varieties, and some of them pump the bilge, and some of them uh, shoot the guns, and some of them sail the ship. Uh, but we've got a group of people who are all doing this together and kind of collaborating, even though there's individual action with respect to the, to the games. And what we did was uh, we actually, in, in this case, actually got the code for Puzzle Pirates. It's a, uh, from a great group uh, here in the city called Three Rings. And then started to think about what it would be like to strip out the puzzling. This is just like the cancer cells, put them into the Star Wars galaxies and put in uh, other work that's so easy people get bored and quit, like working in a call center. So uh, you come to work in a call center, instead of puzzling, you're going to resolve a call. But you're going to join a team, you're going to be part, you're going to have a reputation, you're going to have points. Uh, you know, I'm the call center operator, I can, anybody can look at my uh, points here, I'm part of another group. And I'm actually, when, I, when I'm doing my, the, the call, I'm actually doing the equivalent of puzzling, but I'm seeing the same metrics f change in that interface. I'm, I'm seeing all the numbers change. I'm getting reinforcement in short time domains. Uh, uh, there's a program that's searching for uh, bad words that somebody might say, and hopefully there are, there are uh, fewer of them at the end of the call, at the beginning of the call. Maybe there's voice stress analysis. Whatever it is, there are things that are popping up, just like in the real game, that make it a little bit more engaging. Okay, and then the last thing I'm going to mention is a, a kind of a non-obvious application of games. It's, a, it's something that I'm uh, working on right now. 
And this one, on, unlike several of the others I mentioned, has actually got to the point of a real software. So if anybody's interested in actually uh, testing this, please let me know. So one of, the, one of the most obvious things that people do with games, so all these big companies now have groups that say, games, God, that's really important. We've got to figure out what our game strategy is. And when you do that, and you look at World of Warcraft, this is what mostly you end up with. So we've got avatars over here and self-representation and people in a 3D world and the metaverse and all those great things. And we want to do that with our company as well. So you can go to Second Life, for example, right now. And there are 20 different companies that have set up shop there. You can go into a Wells Fargo branch. Uh, you can go to the Almondon Research Labs, IBM. Uh, there's a Reuters reporter running around Second Life actually reporting news uh, and reporting news out of Second Life. Uh, and these people are all extremely serious about uh, their, uh, Visa is interested in, in Second Life. Uh, you can imagine why. Uh, so a lot of corporate interest here that, that is pretty much the obvious. So I'll mention that and that, that's kind of interesting. But let me just do one thing here and look at some of these games under the hood. So that's kind of the over the hood obvious uh, implication of these games. And this has to do with uh, the uh, notion of the marketplace that I mentioned before. So if you start looking underneath here, not the, the, the higher level interface level, you start, look at, you start seeing some of the other elements that I had in that recipe listed of transparency of repu reputations, economic systems that allow exchange between players, uh, and a lot of stuff that's happening that's not necessarily happening uh, at the level of the most obvious interface. So you get this infrastructure. You get a notion of an infrastructure that allows this complex gameplay that's beyond the avatars and beyond the physical uh, the 3D worlds. And the economy is really one of those um, uh, aspects of games. So if we wanted to, if, 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 if the goal is to steal from games, we got the obvious stuff, the self-representation, 3D worlds, but this, this notion of, of taking the infrastructure for this, and I'm just going to call it a virtual economy, <clears throat> excuse me, for right now, and repurposing it, and then letting it emerge in enterprise software or for tasks that, that, that are not in an entertainment context. And that's one of the things that, that we're working on. So uh, we're working on this. We've created this visual, uh, virtual economy uh, that is inspired by multiplayer games but has no avatars uh, that exchanges virtual currency. In this particular case, they're called Serios. Uh, we exchange this virtual currency via email. These are secure private transactions. Uh, and we're, when I uh, uh, click a new message in my Outlook uh, client right here, I get uh, 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 an interface that allows me to attach units of that currency to send to someone. Terry, I've got a great idea for a research project. And I know your inbox is a wasteland because you've got so many people proposing things to you that I'm going to give you 100 units of this scarce resource that we both share. Uh, you know, uh, of this currency, and he'll know in his inbox, and I uh, have a, a method to actually attach that currency, and he'll know in his inbox that, uh, that, uh, that I sent him 100 units of the currency, and he can uh, say, uh, dear Byron, here's 50 units back. I'm going to keep the other 50 because the idea wasn't so great. Uh, or he can say, here's 150 back and 50 of, the, of my hard-earned uh, currency because I thought it was, uh, you know, th and thanks for sending, send more. And we get this flywheel started, just like in the games, that gets this whole economic system spinning. And so we're, we can attack various problems. Uh, there are different, uh, different categories here. We can start to think about attacking the problem of, of information overload and infomania and the fact that our inboxes are wastelands because of the declining cost of communication and what the hell, send it to everybody. And uh, one executive from uh, our MediaX, uh, uh, in our MediaX program at Glax Smith. GlaxoSmithKline told a story about someone that, uh, that was broadcasting to every employee of the company uh, the uh, story of kittens being born and up for adoption and whatnot. And you've all got inboxes like that. So this economy can kind of start dealing with that. Uh, it can also do things that are very interesting uh, that are also game-like that, that virtual economies uh, uh, might be very good for, setting up internal markets in companies. Prediction markets, Intel has a, uh, basically a game uh, where they hand out uh, 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 virtual currency and uh, people that work in the company predict chip market in different uh, geographic reason, regions. 
and you run it like a game and you allow uh, in this particular piece of software you allow different ways to observe these interactions I have a transaction history with with Terry that's very much like uh, transaction history in the games and I can tell uh, who sent whom more of the currency I can start to look at the network that I'm part of and the value exchanges in my entire network and uh, uh, which is very interesting in the games also, by the way, in an active research area actually looking at how the social networks change. But th in this case, it's a social network that's based on value exchanges, not necessarily just uh, contact, the, the amount of email I send you. Uh, and then you start to make rewards. Uh, I can actually give badges, recognition, uh, in a way that, we do, that they do in the game that, games that, that is in a short time domain uh, and that starts to be interesting for me to want to share and want to brag about. So that's a, uh, that's a, a current uh, software project. If anybody's interested in that, let me know and we can uh, uh, make it possible for you to see how it works. Um, um, and it's a, a kind of a non-obvious uh, uh, application of these games. I think I'll stop there and um, see if there are any, any of this menu folks would like to talk about or happy to answer questions. Yeah. So in the spirit of your talk, I want to take a high-risk approach and ask a couple of questions. Um, in, in looking at responses, you talked about the difference between agents and avatars. Have you looked at the difference between being physically present and being present vis-a-vis -vis, uh, some video, audio, mediation, uh, and whether or not that's live, perceived by the viewer as live? Or, 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 or you do an experiment where I interact with you live versus an experiment where you look at me on We're computer. doing on video. There, there is a literature on that. And, yeah. and, and if, you know, it would be interesting to see if the, the same physical measures, uh, there was a, a progression of yeah. what the difference was. And the other one that I wanted to ask you was about different user interfaces. So instead of a, a mouse or, or, or some keys yeah. on a keyboard, uh, there's a bunch of stuff that's appearing in the game world now that has to do with other kinds of gestures, whether uh, by hand or by other parts of the body. Or, uh, or yeah. In fact, there was, there's some stuff that's been done with brain waves. And, and yeah, so that has, if that has an effect on, the, on, on how, okay. how I physically uh, uh, respond. So the first one is, is really a, a, a great one in, in the context of the larger literature. Is there a hierarchy of, of uh, ways to define the stimuli uh, with live person to person being on one end and that one's a tough one because you know we can I can be bored silly in a virtual reality environment and I can cry when I read uh, so it's it, there's there's no perfect progression there but there is a, a volume knob uh, and and uh, I, I mentioned the collaboration with Cliff Nass right at the beginning of this where we were looking at features of and we, we had people uh, responding politely to computers uh, in, you know, that it was just a hunk of, it, there were words in the interface, no pictures, nothing special at all. So I think there is a progression, however, uh, when you create richer pictures, you're turning up the volume. Uh, and, and, it, and, and, and there is that progression, but it's not, it, it's not necessarily the case that just by changing the modality or the interface features or the, the resolution of the picture or add voice or whatnot, that when you cram more and more things in there, that, that these that these responses automatically uh, increase. Imaging is, imagining a, a friend is, uh, uh, is, as a, can be as arousing as actually having one present. So, so there's, it's kind of a, uh, a, a two-edged sword there in terms of the answer to that, but it's an interesting question that kind of organizes the entire literature on presence and perceived reality and whatnot, immersion. Uh, and if you're building stuff, you're obviously interested in all things being equal, does it, does it help to increase uh, uh, the image fidelity? Yeah, yeah, it does. Does it help to have surround sound instead of monorail sound? Yeah, it, it, you can get a little bit juicier responses. And then the, the, the second one, other, other uh, I.O., mostly uh, input devices, is that, was that the question? I mean, we really haven't, I mean, the answer with respect to my lab is that we're big on, on this and, you know, fingers and, and really pretty simple things, but there are, uh, you can imagine there are a whole lot of, uh, uh, we've got our uh, Wii's ordered and uh, you know, we're, we're really interested in a lot of different uh, ways that, that these arousal responses in particular might be 
uh, accented. But we have, we've done things uh, on image size. That's very interesting with respect to arousal. It's only input devices, as you described. But there's another class where there's actual physical feedback. So that uh, you push against something and it pushes back. Yeah. And, yeah. And, or you move your body and it moves you back. Yeah, uh, and I'm, I'm aware of all those. We just really haven't used that much enough. I mean, my my uh, my hypothesis would be that if that if, if force feedback or whatever the the, the uh, was present in there, if that made it seem more like physical action in the real world, that it would uh, you know it would increase the responses that I was interested. That would be just kind of an umbrella hypothesis. So there there have been people that actually built games that use physiological feedback. So I was at uh, one game manufacturer who had a, uh, a game where you, you are on a laptop and you had a sensor that ac could actually read the skin conductance levels and then you're playing the game with a joystick on the other one and you were shooting people. And when you shoot people, uh, one slide I skipped over quickly, it's very arousing, uh, even on a picture. Uh, and so, so you shoot someone the sensor picks up arousal increasing, and it makes the game harder. So the game is to shoot the people and not get aroused. So it's kind of a biofeedback game. It's not a kind of a dastardly thing to propose, but it was uh, to, to look at uh, an, another input mechanism. Um, it's not quite the control the interface with your brain, but um, yes. In the green dot game. Yeah. In which case did they do better? Uh, that's interesting. We, we, there, it was about the same in both both cases, and we didn't have a lot of great metrics to keep keep track of whether they were you know, what better was. We just said follow as closely as you can. I think it actually said without overrunning, um, and so there, that wasn't really interest, uh, the metric of interest. But that would be really interesting to uh, to see if there was more hesitation to get close to the green dot that was actually another person. Uh, I know uh, Jeremy Balenson and Nikki have done uh, studies about uh, physical, where you stand physically in relation to another avatar in Second Life. And the, uh, the um, manipulation of physical personal space is, it works pretty much the same as it does in real life. If I walk up to Terry, and he'll kind of step back usually. And, uh, and it, it, it happens with avatars as well. <laughs> Anything? Yes? That game where... 35 users got together in an online, online environment to identify cancer cells mm -hmm. and ended up doing better than the regular pathologist. Yeah. Uh, how did they make their decision on whether a It's a dichotomous choice. It's either cancer or not. But So you have 35 people, but how did they come up with a group decision? Oh, it's just uh, uh, vo uh, voting, uh, um, aggregate, aggregating individual votes. Another question is that so you mentioned a conference on fashion games and education. Yes, there are there are a lot of them. Uh, uh, the Serious Game Summit is one of the one of the best ones held twice a year. But if you if you put in if, if you Google conferences, learning and games, there are several others. So the Game Developers Conference uh, is another one in that. So uh, in the Serious Game Summit. Uh, is uh, at least once a year, I think, uh, uh, offered in um, their agenda is offered next to the GDC event. Different universities have had there. There are uh, a lot of people at USC, at the University of Wisconsin, CMU, uh, that are interested in games and learning, and, and a lot of university conferences. We had our own conference here about two years ago. Haven't really done it again yet, but. Is the gaming development yeah, development? Game Developers Conference. Okay. But that's, that's huge. I mean, that's mostly entertainment. It's not, not games for work and games for learning. Um, but it's huge. And, and it's got one of the uh, most fun floors uh, to wander around of any, any conference. Yeah, hey, what sort of broad response? I'm curious to your thinking about it. Go back to your slide 12. Yeah. So I was looking at that slide. Um, Um, it's characteristic. Oh, okay. Elements of games. Okay. Yeah. The gamer generation. Yeah. Thinking about gamer generation. Yeah. I happened to think about Iraq. And I was thinking, okay, trial and error is the best plan. There always is an answer. Failure doesn't hurt. 
<laughs> These are mottos. <laughs> <laughs> the thing is, in the game environment, all game environments, when you turn off the machine, you're back in your world, which is whatever it was. Right. And is this psychologically, this training and this sort of way people thinking carry over to where they think <coughs> so that's going to work in the real world? Yeah. Uh, th there's a general interest in media to, s to know whether that's the case. I mean, if I see a lot, and I'll just give you the, the more popular version of that of, if I see every night on the newscast, blood and guts next to the highway, you know, my local newscast, what will be my response when I actually drive by the blood and guts? Will I be desensitized? Will somehow this be, uh, I'll feel detached from it because it's really more like a picture and whatnot? And the answer is, yeah, a little bit. And, and I think, I mean, the, I didn't mention many, or this at all, I don't think, but the folks that are really interested in this are exactly the folks you mentioned, the military. The, the whole gaming, uh, the whole application of games in serious context. I mean, th that's everything from go to the game parlors and recruit the guys with the best hand guy coordinations to be the pilots, which happens. Uh, but, but now it's not necessarily the pilots for the real planes and the aircraft carriers, but it's the, you know, go be a pilot uh, uh, for a, a remote drone where you're actually uh, watching a screen to get it done. But yeah, I think this does change how, how you actually evaluate. Um, Real physical interactions. I have a, a, a sort of pre computer example um, of this in the gaming environment. Um, there, was a, there was a guy um, who was a teacher in New York City who put a Monopoly game physically in his classroom and they played it once uh, one hour a day. Mm -hmm. And you could, you know, in shop, you could build little houses and you could charge, charge rent around the class. There was a, there was a play money. Uh, situation, um, and he reported. Um, I talked to him once uh, uh, that uh, there's one. Uh, was it was about six graders, roughly six, seven graders, if I recall, um, who got chosen uh, last or near last in the uh, when you're choosing baseball uh, people for your team. Mm -hmm. He wasn't very good at baseball. And uh, however, in the game, uh, as they played it over the semester, um, uh, different, different roles got to be uh, needed. And he got to be the, the banker in the classroom yeah. in the game. And suddenly, the um, teacher noticed, he got to be selected second or third on the <laughs> baseball team yeah. without his skills improving. Yeah. <laughs> so my question in this case, is, I mean, this took place within the same social psychological group that met face to face, and yet they were playing the game also. And I'm wondering if that's the kind of setting to kind of tip, begin to test that. Well, th there are so many new opportunities for that generalization to occur. So you take these thousand gamers at IBM. Yeah. I mean, they they all are within a, a hierarchy of rank and level. But now they go into the game and, and somebody starts doing well in the game because, not because they talk fast in the conference room, but because they're just smart or uh, they can, they, they're better at virtual organization than real organization. And then you start uh, getting, and, and that, that reputation has got to carry over uh, uh, to some extent in the real world. And I think that's really an important thing. It's in the boundary of media, no media is not as interesting as it used to be because we're in the media. Uh, I mean, Terry and I meet in the media and then we also meet in the hallway and uh, that's, that's got to be influential. So this leadership study that we did with IBM really brought out a lot of stories that, that, that gamers have about, about the carryover. They voluntarily, voluntarily talk about their real relationships mixed in with their virtual relationships. It's not I mean, it, it's, it's, an, it's an obvious and, uh, and noticed uh, boundary, but it's not the, the most important one. I mean, smart people ver or people I'd like to hang out with versus people I wouldn't like to hang out with, it's far more important than, than virtual real. And there's a lot, a lot of, a uh, uh, fair amount of literature on that uh, coming up also, yeah. There is a whole aspect of, if you will, breaking the third wall between movies or theater that became legitimized by the economy that you're talking about, that you are allowed to take the virtual money or virtual asset and trade them on uh, eBay. There is also the same things. My son is playing some of these games. And there is the whole thing of what you are allowed to hack the game 
yeah. to kind of cheat, but it's yeah. actually, some of it is allowed because you are actually enriching the game by yeah. going and changing the thing. So it's breaking, it's mm -hmm. a sort of creating a continuum between the real world and the virtual world. Uh, that's very true. These are, uh, there's so much emergent, the character of the game is so uh, much emergent in the game uh, based, uh, from the players. It's not all defined by the game designers. There's a game that we've been tra tracking uh, uh, called EVE Online, which I, I, uh, uh, David in the back here is a, an expert in. But we've, th that one's really interesting because the narrative, even the narrative and the, the direction, uh, kind of the producing and direction of what you should do in the game is far less uh, uh, determined by the game itself. So you've got to get in there and you've really got to kind of make it up. So you're, you're, you're not only hacking, you're hacking in many different domains. You know, you're making up your own stories, your own companies, your own groups, and you're kind of hacking or, or trying to get around something, uh, making up new rules. That's a good point. Yes? About your implications of using game techniques in real world. Yes. I was curious, like, for a user, if he knows he's in a game or at a work, how is perception or motivations change? It, so if you're at work and you know you're in a game? Like, you're, you're trying to use game environment at work, but yeah. I know I'm working, so I might not be motivated. Well, when I, I'm that's interesting. I, I mean, the, the hypothesis is that, the, that what you just said is not going to occur to me as much or as certainly as it has in the past, that, that, I, that I enter... You said game world and real world that I enter these things, you know, uh, it's kind of like this in the day and I'm in and out and it's not like I go to work and I'm in the real world and now I go home and I get in front of the screen and now I'm in the game world and, and it's, it's a, a real serial uh, experience. It's just, you know, we're just, uh, so I'm not sure that's actually something that will occur to people, but there is, it, it, the, in the companies that are talking about the games, I mean, that is, your question is asked by, in different ways, by all the executives. You know, hey, this is about work. And, you know, we've got investors and stockholders and we've got metrics and goals and whatnot. And it's not about having fun. But, um, you know, the history of media is just littered with people that have underestimated fun. <laughs> uh, it, it's never wrong to overestimate the role of fun in anything. I mean, w when, when news started on television, you know, I'm sitting at my desk and uh, I will tell you what is important today. And of course, we, you know, look now, we've got, it's a multiplayer game. There are several people that are, that look nice and talk fast and show pictures. And, you know, so the, the fun has crept into everything. Advertising, uh, all media started serious and then moved fun. So I think this notion of the consumer sensibility and the kind of the enterprise sensibility, I think the time has come to, for that to really, uh, there's a whole history, by the way, of enterprise stuff that's already happened. I mean, you can, there, the, the Game Boy preceded the Blackberry, and they kind of looked alike. The, the whole uh, rich media interfaces were available first in, I mean, I, this is game in a broad sense, but in, in rich media first. And, and so I, I think that it's, it's blurring. It's a blurring. Not, no longer BlackBerry is a fun instrument. There's something else they would always go to. But it's used a lot because it's fun. It's just fun. I mean, it, it's just primitively interesting to, to manipulate an interface with all that, all that kind of stuff. And I don't mean fun in the sense of, oh, I'm going to spend a half hour having fun. But I mean just a you know, quick little, it's fun. This is fun to, to actually manipulate an environment by of reaching out and, and touching something. And, uh, so I mean fun in the... In the engagement uh, kind of primitive sense. I don't mean a part, you know, having a party. Yeah. Is there a, a, a known and, and relatively constant correlation between the temperament of, the pe of people in real life and the avatars that they tend to choose? Um, a lot of talk about that, you know, growing literature on that. They're just, all, they're all over the place. I mean, first of all, there's a lot of boys that are girl avatars and girls that are boy avatars. and old people that are young avatars, and uh, uh, the avatar that I had in World of Warcraft for a little while anyway sure had a lot of hair, and, and uh, you know, so there, you, and, and, and then you get into the personality characteristics of them, and, and there, are, there are even some studies that look at uh, 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 different personalities. But you know, one of the interesting things that, that is that a lot of the 
the expert gamers have don't just have an avatar. For, if, if you're a game, if you're a game, in fact, right now you you probably uh, if you're involved in any of these virtual worlds, you probably have five, ten of these avatars, and you might go to World of Warcraft, or you might say to yourself, "Ah, oh, let's play some Warcraft." Um, which avatar will I use tonight? Well, I think I'm going to use the outgoing dominant avatar. Uh, or no, I, I'm feeling a little more like uh, I like to be the shy, submissive avatar. Uh, and, and not only the one dress like this or dress like that. So there's a whole lot of ability to explore other genders and ages and roles and personalities, and I think people do use that. But on the other hand, I, I, we should ask the expert game players in, in the room what, uh, um, you know, whether they're their avatars reflect their, well, let's do ask him. Helen, does your, uh, do your avatars reflect your personality? Um, usually, although I have tried playing male avatars, so I played, you know, this big, like, gigantic one once, and I thought it would be fun to try and get all the way to a really high level without ever revealing that I was a female. So, yeah, it's, it's fun to experiment. Yeah, and there are people writing on this a lot. I mean, not necessarily in my area, but, uh, Anything else? We're, I know we're close on time. Yeah. Have you done any studies on um, style of play in relation to um, physical responses? For instance, if you play a sneaky, stealthy type character who, if ever discovered, gets destroyed, versus the big barbarian type who runs in, acts swinging, and is hard to kill, does that have an effect on players' own physical heartbeat, for instance? It might, it might be much more stressful to play the sneaky type who can't get caught. Yeah, uh, you know, not, not, I, I don't know studies about the sneaky type, but there are, um, we respond to these characters like we do respond to real people. So uh, if you, uh, Ted Castronova did, it, this is not quite an answer to study, but it's such a great result. Uh, this economist, uh, so he, he was interested in looking at um, the effect of quality of characters uh, in things like size and gender, not, not so much your more subtle characters, and how much those influenced the value of those characters when they were sold on eBay. Okay, so uh, controlling for what the characters could do. So you can have little midget characters that can do all the same things as the big giant characters, but the big giant characters sell for more on eBay. Um, and and uh, very disturbingly and interestingly, the men sell for more than the, than the women, about 10 bucks more on and and characters that are averaging about $90. So in where could you ever do that kind of research, uh, uh, you know, other than in a virtual world, which is another story about uh, the research interest in these virtual worlds of, you know, I can make, I can uh, go up to a bunch of people as a, a black character versus a white character, or maybe some of the character features that you mentioned, although we haven't gotten to, to ones that are that subtle yet, but, they're, but that's an interesting, interesting topic, yeah. The study you just mentioned, was that controlled for a gender of the buyer? Uh, just dollars, it was, Ted's an economist. Money, <laughs> money is... <laughs> <laughs> well, because you, you just mentioned like World of Warcraft is a heavily male yeah, it environment, is. and yeah. so that could affect... It could, it could. It but whatever the distribution of gender is and the buyers of those, uh, they're willing to pay more. That was about a year and a half ago, uh, two years. Okay. Terry, I'll let you Thank be you. moderator here. Okay, yeah. For information on other online Stanford seminars and courses, please visit study.stanford.edu. The preceding program is copyrighted by Stanford University. Please visit us at stanford.edu.